Hello everyone, welcome to another Commander Tactics Deck Tech. My name's Pope. In today's video, we're going to be building around the Jund Planeswalker Cat himself, Lord Windgrace. Lord Windgrace for two, a black, a red, and a green comes in with five loyalty. This plus two is going to allow us to draw a card and discard a card, but if we do discard a land, we're going to draw two cards instead. His minus three lets us return two lands from our yard to the battlefield, not tapped I might add. And his ultimate for minus 11 says we can blow up six non-land permits and create six 2-2 cats that have forest walk. And of course, Lord Windrace can be our commander. If you've ventured into any LGS and played some commander, there's a good chance you stumbled upon a Lord Windrace in the past year or so. He is a super strong and fun commander that leans into lands, matter, themes with his ability to discard for value and return lands to the battlefield. But instead of just building your traditional Jund Lands Matter deck that you know and love, I wanted to explore a more toolbox style of play and squash three different themes that work well together into this one amalgamation of a deck. The first theme for our deck is of course Planeswalkers. With a total of nine Planeswalkers in the deck and Windgrace at the helm, our walkers will be used for everything from removal to protection to card draw. One mechanic that marries well with Planeswalkers is of course Proliferate, and that's why our second theme is more counters with an emphasis on proliferating all of our permanents. And lastly, we're going to embrace Windgrace's ability to shuffle around lands and commit a hefty landfall and animator package. And our budget for this deck, not including lands, comes to be less than $200. Now before we dive in, I do want to take a second to talk about one specific car that I've selected for this deck, and that's the enchantment, Doubling Season. Doubling Season is the absolute MVP and star of this deck, enabling us to do all sorts of insanely powerful shenanigans by doubling tokens and counters as they come into the battlefield while this enchantment is on the field. But even with a recent reprint in Battle Bond, Doubling Season is still sitting at almost $50. As a general rule of thumb for myself and when deck building for commander tactics deck techs, I try to steer away from cards that exceed the $25 limit. While it would be easy to put together decks costing thousands of dollars, being able to share these decks with you and then you the viewer be able to build them at a reasonable and budget friendly price is the main focus. But I did feel that doubling season was so good in this particular deck that I carved out one fourth of our entire budget just to include it. By no means is this a must have in the deck and if you'd like to trim off $50 off the cost, everything in this deck will function very close to the same without this particular spell. But now let's get right into things taking a look at all of the amazing planeswalkers that we have selected to help navigate this team through the game, starting with the Nissa Triumvirate that is Nissa World Waker, Nissa Who Shakes the World, and Nissa Vital Force. Nissa World Waker is going to allow us to animate a land into a 4-4 or untap 4 forest lands for plus 1 each with a minus 7 ult that lets us get all of our basics from our deck, put them onto the battlefield, and they become 4-4 creatures with trample. Nissa Who Shakes the World is going to allow us to double the mana of all the forests we tap. For plus 1 we can animate a land, and then for minus 8 we can search our library for all of our forests, put them onto the field, and our lands are now indestructible. And a Vital Force Nissa lets us temporarily animate a land for plus one, return a permanent from our graveyard to our hand for minus three, and her ult for only minus six, we get an emblem that lets us draw a card anytime a land enters our side of the battlefield. Animating lands and potentially losing them as creatures isn't too big of a deal in this deck, as we have many ways to return them and even benefit from having them in our graveyard. Moving on, we have the last of the Nissas with Nissa, Voice of Zendikar, Obnixilis Reignited, and Garrick Wildspeaker. Nissa Voice of Zendikar is going to let us create a 0-1 green plant creature token for a plus 1, but her minus 2 is the big deal, putting a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each creature we control. If we're able to get Nissa out, put our counters on, and then proliferate, doubling those counters, this can be a big swing. Obnixilis Reignited for 5 mana comes in with 5 loyalty. His plus 1 is going to allow us to draw a card and lose a life, but if there is a creature that's threatening our side of the board, we can use his minus 3 to destroy target creature and his ult, which we will probably never see for minus 8 target opponents, going to get an emblem with whenever a player draws a card, you lose 2 life. Next we have Garrick Wildspeaker coming in with 3 loyalty for 4 mana. His plus 1 is going to allow us to untap 2 of our target lands. Minus 1 is going to put a 3-3 green beast creature token on the battlefield, and his minus 4 is going to give all of our creatures plus 3 plus 3 and trample until the end of turn. If we're running lands that can tap for 2 or 3 mana apiece, that plus 1 ability can be huge. 
And rounding out the team, we have three multicolored planeswalkers, Vraska Relic Seeker, Zinigos the Reveler, and Garrick Cursed Huntsman. Vraska Relic Seeker for four, a black and a green comes in with six loyalty. We can plus two her to create a two-two black pirate creature token with menace. Minus three, we can destroy a target artifact, creature, or enchantment, and we get a treasure back. And then minus ten, we can make a target player's life total become one. Xenagos the Reveler, played at the right time, can do work. For four mana, coming in with three loyalty, it says plus one, add X mana in any combination of red and or green to your mana pool, where X is the number of creatures you control. We have created a lot of tokens up till now. This can give us a ton of additional mana to ramp into the huge spells for late game. Then a zero ability is going to let us create a 2-2 red and green satyr creature token. And then lastly, his ultimate for minus six. We can exile the top seven cards of our library and put any lands and or creatures from among those seven straight onto the battlefield. And lastly, Garrick Cursed Huntsman coming straight out of Throne of Eldraine for six mana. We get a five loyalty planeswalker Garrick. This says for zero, we can create two, two, two black and green wolf creature tokens. With whenever these die, put a loyalty counter on each Garrick you control. So if we do happen to have two Garricks out, this will double down and give us each a counter. For minus three, we can destroy a target creature and draw a card. And for minus six, we get an emblem with creatures we control, get plus three, plus three, and have trample. With all the proliferate and additional way to add counters onto Garrick, we can easily get that minus six, possibly even the turn he comes down. And lastly, we have two spells that are just going to support all of our planeswalkers, Oath of Nyssa and Kamal's Druidic Vow. Oath of Nyssa, a legendary enchantment for only one green, says whenever it enters the battlefield, we get look at the top three cards of our library. We can put a creature, land, or planeswalker from among them into our hand, put the rest on the bottom. Then, with Oath of Nyssa on the battlefield, we can spend mana as though it were any color to cast our planeswalker spells. Oath of Nyssa early can help us make sure we don't miss any land drops or get the right creature or planeswalker we need, and then help us curve into casting those planeswalkers. Kamal's Druidic Vow from Dominaria for X, a green, and a green, a legendary sorcery. So we have to have a legendary either planeswalker or creature on the battlefield to cast it. But we get a look at the top X cards of our library, and then we can put any number of lands and legendary permanents from among them with converted mana cost X or less straight onto the battlefield. Ramp early game or a bomb late game Druidic Vow is going to help us get what we need when we need it. But now that we've seen all the planeswalkers that we're going to be running with this deck, let's take a look at all the spells we're going to be casting to add counters on all of our permanents across the board and maybe even some of our opponents. Starting things off with three creatures that are going to put minus one minus one counters onto our opponent's side of the field. Hapatra, Vizier of Poisons, the Scorpion God, and a Yawgmoth Thran Physician. Hapatra Vizier of Poisons is a human cleric 2-2 for a black and a green. This is whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may put a minus one minus one counter on target creature. Whenever you put one or more minus one counters on a creature, create a 1-1 one, one green snake creature token with death touch. Do keep in mind for Hapatra's effect to trigger, she does not have to be the one putting the minus one minus one counters on the creature. The Scorpion God for 5 mana, 6-5 body, says whenever a creature with a minus 1 counter on it dies, draw a card. For 3 mana, 1, a black and a red, we can put a minus 1 counter on another target creature, and when the Scorpion God dies, we can return it to our hand at the beginning of the next end step. Card draw and removal all on one body, and with the addition of all the proliferate abilities we have, the Scorpion God can help us generate a ton of card advantage and remove any threats we might have to deal with. And lastly, the Big Daddy himself out of Modern Horizons, Yogmoth Thran Physician. Yogmoth has protection from humans. We can pay one life, sacrifice another creature, put a minus one, minus one counter on up to one target creature and draw a card. And then we can pay two black to discard a card and proliferate. All of these cards synergize so well together, putting tons of minus one, minus one counters out there on opponent's creatures, proliferating, drawing cards all while removing threats on our opponent's sides of the board. Next up we have three spells that are going to help us proliferate, adding more counters to our permanents and hopefully more minus one counters to our opponent's permanents. With Contagion Clasp, Evolution Sage, and Volt Charge. Contagion Clasp for two mana, whenever it enters the battlefield we get to put a minus one minus one counter on a target creature. Then for four mana we can tap it to proliferate. Evolution Sage, a 3-2 Elf Druid for three mana, says whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control we get to proliferate. Evolution Sage with Lord Windgrace on the battlefield can cause us to proliferate a ton. And then if we're playing things like Fetch Lands or Evolving Wild, Fabled Passage, 
Terramorphic Expanse, those all double dip, adding two proliferates per turn. And lastly, an instant speed spell for two and a red. Volt Charge deals three damage to target creature or player, then we get to proliferate. I like Volt Charge in this deck as a kind of hidden way to proliferate at instant speed if our planeswalkers are about to die, or if we need to add more minus one counters to our opponent's side of the board, we can then cast Volt Charge and catch our opponents way off guard. Coming in next, we have three spells that are going to help get plus one, plus one counters to our creatures on our side of the board. Grumgully the Generous, Rhythm of the Wild, and Pure Imaginative Rascal. Grumgully coming straight out of Throne of Eldraine for one, a red, and a green. We get a 3-3 Goblin Shaman that says each other non-human creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. Keep in mind, any tokens we have entering while Grum Gully is on the battlefield also does benefit from this. Rhythm of the Wild, a great new enchantment for Gruul. Creature spells you control can't be countered, and non-token creatures you control have Riot, meaning they enter the battlefield with your choice of a plus one, plus one counter, or haste. And then Peer, Imaginative Rascal, legendary creature out of battle bond, does partner with Toothy, Imaginary Friend, but Toothy is blue so we are not running him in this deck. But Peer alone says if one or more counters would be put on a permanent your team controls, that many, plus one of each of those kinds of counters are put on that permanent instead. With Peer on the board, anytime we're adding counters to our creatures or upticking our planeswalkers is going to add one additional, helping us get bigger and more threatening as quick as possible. And lastly, rounding out our counters, we have two artifacts, Astral Cornucopia and Everflowing Chalice, both which come into the battlefield with counters on them. Astral Cornucopia has triple X in its cost and it enters with X charge counters on it. Then we can tap it for a color of mana equal to the number of charge counters. In most cases, we're going to be casting Cornucopia for only 1-1-1, one, 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 so 3 total mana to tap for 1, which just is a mana lift. But then we're going to proliferate and find ways to add more counters to this, meaning it's going to tap for a ton of mana. And then Everflowing Chalice, similar effect. We can pay two per charge on it. Whenever it enters the battlefield, we get a charge counter on it for each two mana we spent to cast it. Tap for one colorless for each charge counter on it. Same deal, when we get it in, we're probably only going to cast it for two, maybe four mana, but then we're going to find ways to add more counters to it, proliferate, and find ways to help us ramp out even quicker. But now that we've seen all the planeswalkers and all the spells we're going to be casting to boost our team, let's take a look at how we are going to take advantage of Lord Windgrace's ability with all the landfall and animating abilities we have in the deck. Kicking things off with three very powerful landfall effects on Avenger of Zendikar, Omnixilus the Fallen, and Rampaging Baloths. Avenger of Zendikar for 7 mana whenever it enters, we're going to create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each land we control. Then, whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we get to put a plus one, plus one counter on each plant creature we control. A huge army of plants constantly getting more counters on them, proliferating to add even more is just a great way to round out games. And I should also mention that there are multiple ways to create plant creature tokens in this deck, so they will also benefit off of Avenger of Zendikar's landfall trigger. Omnixilus, the Fallen, Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we can have a target player lose 3 life. If we do, we get to put 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Omnixilus, the Fallen. With all the ways we have to recur land from our graveyard, Omnixilus can be pinging our opponent down for 3 at a time, multiple times each turn, and getting huge in doing so. And then just a real great value card, Rampaging Bayloth. For 6 mana, we get this Trampler 6-6, six, six. but with Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we get to create a 4-4 four, four green beast creature token. This is going to help us go wide and then get in for the most damage we can. Next we have two enchantments that are going to benefit off of all the Landfall we got going on. Kalani Heart Expedition and Retreat to Kazandu. Kalani Heart Expedition is going to help us ramp, says Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, we get to put a quest counter on it. Then we can remove three quest counters from it to search our library for two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. With all the additional ways we have of getting quest counters onto the expedition, good chance we could possibly get this to activate the turn it comes down. 
and retreat to Kaz and do another enchantment landfall whenever a land enters the battlefield we get to choose one we can either put a plus one counter on a target creature or we can gain two life modal spells like this can help us in a tight pinch if our life total is low or it can help buff our team to help us win with a big combat step Coming in next, we have three spells that are going to help us animate our lands to help us beat down our opponents. Embodiment of Insight and Embodiment of Fury and then Sylvan Awakening. Embodiment of Insight is a elemental for four and a green 4-4 creature with vigilance that says land creatures you control have vigilance. Then our land falls whenever a land enters the battlefield. We can have a target land we control become a 3-3 elemental creature token with haste until the end of turn. And Embodiment of Fury is almost the exact same thing as Insight except with Trample. It has Trample, lands we control have Trample, and our Landfall Trigger says whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we get to have a target land become a 3-3 elemental with haste until the end of turn. Sylvan Awakening is one of our single card finishers saying until your next turn, all lands you control become 2-2 elemental creatures with reach, indestructible, and haste. A properly timed Sylvan Awakening with the right creatures and the right state can really just close a game out. And then lastly to round out the squad we have two creatures that are going to let us double dip on the landfall triggers the Gitrog monster and Mina and Den Wildborn. The Gitrog monster is a great absolute all star in this deck with death touch a 6-6 six, six for 5 mana. At the beginning of our upkeep we're going to sacrifice the Gitrog monster unless we sacrifice a land. Then we can play an additional land on each of our turns and whenever one more lands are put into our graveyard from anywhere we get to draw a card. So not only did we get to play two lands a turn, we have to sacrifice a land and with Lord Windgrace we can discard lands, get tons of card draw and tons of value with the Gitrog monster. And Mina and Den Wildborn again you can play an additional land on each of our turns but they also have the added ability of for a red and a green, we get to return a land card to our hand and give one of our creatures trample until the end of turn. This can be a sneaky ability if our opponents aren't paying attention and we've got a big guy coming in who doesn't have trample, activate this ability and give them trample at the last possible second. But now that we've seen the ins and outs of this triple threat deck, let's take a look at what else is inside the 99. For removal and control in this deck, we have about 7 to 8 targeted abilities and effects and 5 board clears. But I should also mention we have the minus 1, minus 1 counters, which can be aggressively put on for additional targeted removal. Our card advantage in this deck boils down to about 10 different spells and abilities. From planeswalkers to creature effects, we should have no problem keeping a full grip with this deck. Our ramp package in this deck is extra spicy with about 12 to 13 effects and spells. Many of these spells in conjunction with proliferation will create tons of additional mana to help us get to those big spells super fast. With so many powerful spells in this deck there are tons of ways to win but I did boil it down to about three main ways. Number one, we're going to be casting tons of planeswalkers and several of them have ultimates that are just basically going to win you the game. But if that doesn't work we can go for the go wide strategy, create tons of tokens and then just swing out for huge combat steps. And if that doesn't work we can use spells like worm harvest and retrace it casting it over and over again constantly putting pressure on our opponents or sylvan awakening to animate all of our lands and try to swing out for one huge combat step. But that is going to do it for this Jund powerhouse. Lord Windgrace has the ability to do lots of crazy things and while lands matter clearly is his forte, I think he can be built in tons of different directions. The full deck list for this super friends counters landfall deck can be found down in the description below. If you have any recommendations for our next deck tech, let us know in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this deck tech, you can let us know by interacting with that like button. If you want to know when our next video is released make sure you subscribe and a new deck tech will be here every Friday at 9 a.m. Central. Thanks so much for watching guys and we'll see you for the next one.